Qvert can consume it and know that we have a data volume and it's going to be consumed by a VM, but we're waiting for the import to complete first. So it's, it's looking at the well-defined API we've created, which is the data volume, waiting for the import to complete, and then we can launch a virtual machine uh, using that data volume and the PVC that's underlining under, under it. Um, there's some integration work that I'm working on right now that's going to actually let Qvert dynamically create these data volumes during the start flow. And uh, I have a document, a design document up right now that outlines how we can do that. And I'm working on implementing that right now. So that should land sometime in like the next week or two. Any questions about what's going on there that I can answer? I've got a question, David. Um, in terms of functional testing, when the support gets added to the Qvert repo, do you anticipate um, consumption of a CDI in order to power those tests then, or would, would we do something else? I'm just kind of starting to, to prepare and thinking about from that project's point of view being consumed that way. So I do think that we need CDI in our functional test suite, especially since it's going to be a critical path. Um, that doesn't negate the fact that we already have like straight up PVC testing right now. I think that CDI is thing in addition to that. It's going to be something that uh, functionally um, only gets functional test when CDI is present. So we'll have you know some some checks in there to say only run this test if CDI exists. Uh, I do see it being something that we uh, we put in Qvert's functional tests though, for sure, especially once we integrate it. Um, integrate the data. That's the only way we can really test the integration of the data volume. It's right. the test CDI directly. So uh, okay. we'll probably be locked into a specific version of CDI and have mm -hmm. to, you know, be very explicit when we update the release and things like that in our unit test suite. Makes sense. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Fabian, I just added um, a note about the go get Qvert IO. Is there anything that we want to um, declare publicly about that effort? Well, I declare hereby that it's working, even in a secured manner. So actually, and I wanted to take that, I want to note that. So two weeks ago on Friday, we fixed it. And four hours later, the certificate from GitHub, they created ran out. That was impossible to detect because they do it transparently to us. So it was a coincidence. So it worked and then it didn't. I re opened the ticket and did a little, little bit of messing and now it's fixed. So we have HTTPS for Kubernetes.io. So go get will work, including the metadata. I hope everybody's happy now. Don't bother me with that, please, again. Thank you for that friendly reminder. Um, I don't know if uh, Tommy Hughes is on the line or not. Um, don't see his name actually. So I will speak to this. Uh, in the last 24 hours or so, we uh, merged a pull request for the memory field uh, was missing from the requests section, which I think was breaking people in 0 0.6. So that's, uh, that's been added and forward looking in 0 0.7, that should no longer be an issue hopefully. All right, well, um, is there anything else for the uh, status update section of the agenda and notes? Can we post the document to the chat? It might have been posted before I joined. I, I can't find it in my history. First link I posted was just uh, the GitHub issues that have closed recently in case anybody has their memory jogged on something that would be worth discussing. Um, and the second one should be that link you requested, David. Uh, so I have a, an update, I think, with regards to the lifecycle hooks. So I did a prototype where I actually took the schema.go uh, and then I put that in a separate package. <clears throat> I serialized our libvirt XML into it and the fields that we're interested in 
serializing to and from work pretty seamlessly with the XML annotations we have existing. So I think um, once uh, Peter has some, something working, I'll submit a follow-up PR to perhaps refactor the, the schema.go and types.go in the, I think it's called the vert launcher, sorry, vert, vert wrapper, um, so that we can have safe serialization to and from XML. Even if it's just for the Go bindings. I don't know if you guys, what do you guys think about that? Well, it's kind of limiting, is it not? Because we don't represent the entire libvirt domain XML. We just have like a subset that's being actually modeled. Yeah, it, it is limited, but I think for the drivers that, uh, uh, well, so, so I think it's beneficial on, on one side is that it's the same types, right? So like from kubevert, there is no, no change uh, in terms of the API. And two, for people that want to integrate with the, with like the Go, even if it's not uh, like fully representative, uh, it, it's pretty nice for me at least to, to use that uh, because the fields that I'm interested in propagating to kubevert are all already there in that XML. So I think as a separate package, it makes sense. Um, and then I also decoupled two fields, which are part of the Kubernetes, especially the time, time, time fields. Uh, they don't need to be part of uh, the Kubernetes API, so that also lowers the, the number of dependencies on that sub-package. But I'm not sure if you guys are interested in, in that follow-on patch or not. Uh, I actually, I see what you're getting at with uh, it being way easier to consume the libvirt uh, domain XML if it's, you know, pack or if it's delivered in the hook as, you know, structs that people can modify and send back. That's interesting. Is yeah. There yeah, let me just add here. Uh, in yeah. the past, there was already the discussion if we should use this libvirt go XML struct. Back then, it didn't have much value, but for the hook, we can, of course, adopt it. It should be pretty complex, uh, pretty much complete. That's, that's actually a really good point. I knew, yeah, I knew that existed. It was in the back of my head. That's what we should be looking at. Actually, I wonder. Um, how would that work? I mean, would you keep the um, the hook API using a string because it's going over protobuf and then do the deserialization on, on the... Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I prototype. I prototype packing the livered XML in a string and then serializing it using the current uh, that .go types, like schema that .go. And I just removed the dependencies on the Kubernetes. We only have two or three dependencies on Kubernetes for the schema that .go. So, uh, yeah, so anyways, it could be just one file. It should be pretty seamless. If you yeah. Can. yeah, that sounds good because my only concern is still only to blow up the protobuf definition, but if we keep the string there, then it should be fine. That's a cool idea, actually, yeah. I agree. And it's something that, so it's just on the SDK client side that we would be consuming Levert uh, Go XML. Um, so right. when we send back, for example, you know, we create our, we inject all our Levert domain XML changes and everything. When we send it back, it's being converted to a JSON string and sent back to uh, that's how, you know, Qvert sees it. So they don't have to know about the fields that have been added that they're unaware of, that Qvert's not aware of. Is that, is that right? Do I have this? Yeah, and, I, and I, it's really easy. The, the change should be relatively small. So like once, the, once Peter's change is up, I can just submit a follow-up PR. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. Look at the uh, libvirt go XML, whatever that package is called. OK, we'll do. Let me add the link. So, post the link to the chat to the Libert Quicks package. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, are there any other things we'd like to add? I see you typing, Vladek. So you're up whenever you're done typing, Vladek. Network API updates. Yeah, sorry, had to find the window. Um, yeah, so from the networking API updates, it's. Um, um, last week, uh, 
we've merged um, the basic uh, network API uh, changes. Um, and uh, it has been followed by uh, some functional tests that were merged. And um, so there was a work that allowed um, uh, multiple networks to be specified. That's not actually, um, it's not that we actually can use multiple networks at the moment to just uh, restructure. Um, so we would support and, uh, and test for multiple networks. And in parallel to this, there's, um, there's also work that um, um, is ongoing for merging the um, uh, Slurp interface. And um, it's pretty much, it's pretty close. I'll post a link to this. Um, that, that's pretty much it. Any questions? <coughs> Sorry. Okay, cool. No questions. Uh, I'll circle back and grab that link for the slurp uh, pull request or if you don't get to it first. Thank you. <clears throat> So if there's nothing else in terms of um, agenda and notes, we do have an item for the open floor that is sort of emergent yesterday. Um, as part of the dev KVM uh, changes that were in pull request 1099, um, we had to make a choice between uh, the V1 alpha one and the V1 beta one uh, API versions for Kubernetes device plugins because it changed between 1.9 and 1.10. It obviously makes sense to continue with 1.10. So the pull request itself and the way that the head of the Git tree currently reflects is that we're supporting 1.10 and not 1.9 at all. So we're at a crossroads. We can either add uh, support for um, 1.9, Kubernetes 1.9 or OpenShift 3.9 uh, but it would have to not be using the uh, device plugin framework. It would just simply go back to the old privileged mode the way it worked before, or we can just declare that we don't want to support them and just go with uh, Kubernetes 1.10 or OpenShift 3.10. The problem is that OpenShift 3.10 is not yet out, so just yeah. want to gauge people's concern level on that. That's a little update. I, I just succeeded today to deploy OpenShift 3.9 with my own RPM that I created from uh, OC 3.10 uh, release candidate tag uh, and it worked. So I want to push it uh, to our repository. We will have it temporary until we will have official release. Uh, the one problem that I have is uh, I still cannot make it work uh, described because uh, from some reason it just depends on some cryo tools package that uh, uh, I don't have and origin does not provide it. So it's some small update. Awesome, thank you. So I would uh, infer from that that the uh, OpenShift 3.10 release is not terribly far out. We're not talking months. We're talking weeks at most, question mark. Uh, I don't aware about OpenShift releases, to be honest. Just, I don't know when it will, will be released. So. Right. OK, so but at the very least, we could use the release candidate as once we get it working, if possible, as a viable 3.10 target in the interim, or that's one option we could take, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I will push uh, uh, the PR uh, today or tomorrow, so I think we will have at least uh, OpenShift without trial, but 3.10. Do we have a Kubernetes 1.10 cryo provider yet? Uh, no, no, we don't have. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I, I did not uh, look on it uh, uh, because uh, when I tried OpenShift, I, I had some problem with this cryo package because again, it's not, uh, it not looks like uh, they have some normal release process. Maybe they already have it, but when I look at it, they not. So 
again, I created uh, Cryo for free of mind by myself, so I wanted uh, to avoid this for Kubernetes. So that's the reason. So it's a prerequisite for dropping anything .9. Uh, we need Cryo to still exist in our CI in some capacity. Sorry, I was just capturing that as a uh, as a point. So. Would we use that uh, consideration as the uh, as the driving factor between which of these two choices we're going to take? It's a it's a factor. I really don't like being in this position. I, Sorry, yeah. I'm mute. Well, here's the thing: um, we are not permanently. Uh, obligated to support uh, one nine or three nine um, once the uh, the things that are limiting us are removed. So the uh, you know adding support re reverting the uh, the behavior to actually still work with the uh, the current and or older versions of Kubernetes and OpenShift is. Uh, it's not something that we have to commit to forever, especially because there's no user facing API changes to it. Um, so we could provisionally take one path and then switch later. If we're very explicit about the time frame, which we're going to allow, like the code path split, you know, we have, I don't like the idea of us having compatibility modes um, yet. I mean, I know we're going to have to have that someday potentially, uh, but it, it just explodes the um, test matrix for us. If we have to say, well, for this path, we're going to take, um, you know, for 1.9, we're going to take this path, for 1.10, we're going to take this path. Um, so I'm trying to avoid it if we can get away with it. it so not take, that logic at all. Um, I know someday we'll, we'll have to, but uh, I'd like to put a little bit more thought into how we do it. Um, so if we introduce that logic, if we're explicit about saying this logic only exists for the time frame of waiting for the 3.10 release, and then we're very um, uh, prompt about removing it, uh, then I'm okay with that. But that. That's like mental energy for us and collectively, like we have to remember these things. We have to, you know, think about the time frame and uh, remember to take care of it when it lands and everything. And it's easy to forget. And we have enough of these to get put in the code base and we do forget. And then a year down the line, we're going to see, you know, this code path split existed and we're going to be all kind of nervous about removing it because we don't really remember why <laughs> why it existed to begin with, you know? So those are the kinds of things I'm trying to avoid. Um, as a one-off, um, I'm being resistant to it because I don't want that to become a pattern for future uh, engagements where we have to think about um, splitting. So it's not that this one example is bad uh, and that this one-off thing is necessarily bad. It's that it sets a precedence for things that could become bad. If that makes sense. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I missed the beginning of what you said, um, David. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that for the older men of us? Okay, man, I, I said a lot of words. I got to repeat all that. I'll try to sum it up. Yeah. Uh, so we have a patch that uh, restores compatibility uh, between. Um, dot 10 and dot nine. So we, you know, essentially with the KVM device manager changes, um, we have a code path that, that splits it from the old behavior that works with dot nine and the new behavior that works with dot 10 using, uh, not device manager, but the device plugins. I'm uh, hesitant to introduce that kind of logic um, because it takes mental energy to keep up with it and we have to remove it. I, I really definitely want us to remove it as soon as 1.10 gets released. And also it sets a precedent for how we continue with this in the, in the future. So in the future, I would like for us to put a lot of thought into how we 
maintain compatibility with previous versions of Qvert and have a structure for how we maintain that. Because what I don't want to see is a year later us to have all these code pass splits, which explodes the test matrix, and for us to be unsure about what can be removed, what can't be removed, why things exist, why these code paths exist, um, exist at all. And then we get to the point where, and I've been here, where we're all just like hesitant to remove anything because we don't really know what it, what it was there for. That's what I'm, <laughs> that's what I want to avoid. Sorry, now I'm in the middle. No, sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> so just to say, uh, the no. patch isn't bad. The pat there's nothing wrong with the patch inherently. The, pa the thing I'm worried about is the precedence it sets for us and uh, yeah. us repeating that pattern in the future. I don't want to, I don't want to encounter this again. I want us to be, uh, have a plan for how we're going to work with compatibility and not have to make uh, a knee-jerk reaction sort of thing just to, to get things to work again. Sounds good. So uh, my personal take is that in general, as, as you said, we, we should not carry these compatibility patches. I think here the time goes really bad. So I think um, that, that the only reason why I'm thinking about that or thought about that compatibility thing is because we completely drop OCP support with that. And that was the only reason why I considered a compatibility patch. Otherwise, I would have not considered it. And by the way, that is why I mentioned on the mailing list to say, let's add, um, how do you call them? Um, um, I mean, branches or support for Kubernetes master and OpenShift master, where we de deploy the master branches of them in order to always have one branch for each of the distributions, because then we don't run into a situation where we completely lose coverage for one distribution, Kubernetes distribution. That was just my thought. I was kind of confused by that. We already run test coverage over 1.9. What do you mean by that? Oh, I mean, I mean, with this, if we don't provide compatibility because we want to avoid doing these compatibility patches, then we would have. Then, in my opinion is that we should take out one nine and OpenShift three nine out of our CI because it will always fail fail there. Of course, yeah. But but that means that OpenShift will not be present in our CI at all anymore. I could be wrong, but I thought we could only not support OpenShift with Cryo right now. But I might have missed something. Ardium, what what was the status there? I, I know you, you spoke a lot to it, but was it that we can't provide a one or three dot ten provider at all, or was it just that we can't yes. provide the Cryo? Okay. Uh, currently, I can provide three dot ten without Cryo support, and uh, I hope today or tomorrow I will push. Um, so currently the only problem is this cryo. Uh, but again, it's very dependent uh, on what uh, people are really are really use. Because uh, officially cryo will be default in 3.11. So until until then we can live without cryo until uh, official release, I believe. Yeah. But but again, we will need to check when when the official release will be available because I just do not worry about it. Yeah. So to make it short, effectively at the moment we cannot provide a 310 provider because there are no packages available. And then, so that means if we now drop 39, then no OpenShift is present in the CI and we effectively reduce the metrics to only having Kubernetes 110, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that is, I mean, dropping a support for distro in general is, is bad. That's why I wondered if we should add providers for Kubernetes master and OpenShift master. Because then we always have those present. The only issue is that master happens to be flaky or master branches in general happen to be flaky. So the question is how much value there is to, to run yeah. our CI against the master branches of Kubernetes. And I, I don't think that we should be doing that. Uh, I just don't know what it tells us because we're never going to trust it. We're going to say, oh, well, it was master that failed. <laughs> so yeah. it's, uh, it might catch some things that are down the pipe, coming down the pipe to us, but we, I don't know. Yeah. I, I guess I don't see the value. If we can see what the value is, then maybe. Yeah. So I think we can make the hard decision to say, all right, then let's drop 
all 1.9 supports, so OpenShift 3.9 and Kubernetes 1.9. And let's not do the compatibility stuff in order to save us work, because it's just an inter a temporary fix. And then we need to live with the bad taste of saying we dropped OpenShift in, in our CUI for a few weeks at worst. E we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna break OpenShift if we do that. There's too much change between the two. Um, yeah. yeah. Why not just do the uh, dispatches to this meeting to be verified like next week that uh, we already added the support for one ten and uh, we will just just drop the patch or revert the patch then uh, until we figure out the mechanism. Yeah. yeah also so, wanted to add it. That in general, there is a revert button on our report request. So the next time, we can also consider that. Yeah. Yeah. So first, I take all of that in my cap, because um, I did not think enough about the implications for CI. Um, the only issue I have with reverting is that this is actually bringing up the point why I was so keen on merging it, because it's so large. And um, um, I saw that Stu spent a lot of time on rebasing the work. And we also risk that it, you know, that there was a massive amount of work done, and um, if it's pushed out so 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 much, then then at some point we we forget about it. It, it might slip again. So that is that was my perspective on things. Why 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 did it merge? Um, actually, you know, can we take it as an action item that we look until the end of the week to see if we find out when they will release the OpenShift three ten release candidate? I mean that's. That three days effectively, and and um, if we have the knowledge by then, then we can decide how to proceed. Because it looks like it's slow. That is my main point. I assume you mean the because uh, the release candidate is actually out as of past tense the last night. Uh, I think what we really need is a consumable version in our CI system. Is that what you mean? More specifically, uh, pa uh, packages which are consumable by Artium to to bring up the provider again. Yeah. At least the perspective, not the final provider. You're the loudest typer ever. <laughs> That's woman, not me. Oh, that was me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so much notes to take, right? Do you have a mechanical <laughs> keyboard? Actually, not. That's a strange, strange thing. So for, me it's, it's, for me, it's pretty quiet. <laughs> I, I'm just messing with you. OK, so Artyom, maybe we can, uh, the OpenShift channel, IC channel is always pretty responsive. Maybe you can drop a question there to see. I mean, because you know best what packages are missing, maybe you can drop a, um, in the, uh, an RC uh, message there. I, again, I can open the issue under the OpenShift Ansible repository, and I uh, got some response on it, uh, but uh, again, it look uh, I don't really aware who is responsible for upstream releases under the OpenShift. I also asked uh, under CNV, <clears throat> under CNV Develop to to help uh, for this issue, and also I not really got some response under it, so. Uh, I just prefer currently to move with my own RPM that I build it from target repository and I don't know. And to, when it will be officially available, I will just move our provider to work with it. It not must be a big deal. Um, the only issue will be if someone uh, instead of me will want to reprovision uh, OpenShift to 3.9 uh, images because uh, he will only just to ping me and ask for my repository uh, for usage. So, well, the solution that I currently have. Okay, so I'll, I'll actually take the offline review and we can see that we can somehow get the packages. Shouldn't be impossible. I mean, they did a release, so it should be there somewhere. In general, by the way, also one note is actually here. We could maintain tags in our Git tree to mark when we drop support for a specific Kubernetes version. So we could eventually say, for example, um, one nine cutoff, which would just be before uh, Stu's patch set, in order to signal that. 
not sure if that's valuable, but on the other end, it might be. Uh, by the way, I believe when we will have another release, could be possible we will have the same problem with the OpenShift uh, that we currently have under under our CI because they still use this uh, OpenShift 3.9, so it will not work for them. Actually, yeah, good that you point out it. Do you, do you recall off the top of your head why precisely 3.10 is required? Why precisely 3.10 is required by the uh, device plugin framework? Yeah, is, it, is it an API so, change? It, yeah, from um, from the V1 alpha one to the V1 beta one uh, API versions, the function signatures and the amount of functions actually physically changed. So they're not, it's not like you can just change out the number. You actually have to uh, use different code to support it. All that said, at some point, when the process of the uh, dev KVM uh, work started, I actually was targeting the 1.9 release uh, and only discovered that it was different when I rebased and ported to 1.10 and went, oops, they're different. So it is physically possible to support the device plugin framework under 1.9 one, under one and 3.9, but we come back to the exact same question that we just had about the, the current uh, workaround, which is, is it worth it? You're adding the exact same, in fact, more, uh, more temporary cruft code to, you know, to the support matrix sort of approach. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if there's a tremendous amount of value in taking that path over the current one just from a keep it simple, stupid point of view. Yeah. I actually wonder, I actually wonder how other projects do that. I mean, because the APIs do, are graduated up from alpha to beta to GA. And I wonder how others do it. Peter, do, do you eventually know how other device plugins handle that? I mean, do they exclusively then work on 110 forward? I think so, because I mean, for us, the 109 version is not backwards compatible. We cannot use it on 110, so. I guess they just need to move to, to the newer one. Newer one. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. It's something good that we run. Good that we have a zero prefix at the beginning of our version, so we can still learn, but um, it's really something to keep in mind the situation. Okay. I'm good on the topic. And an item is to see when, when OpenShift 310 is getting released and see that we get away with that. For now, anybody that wants to use 1.9 and 3.9, by the way, it's um, 0, 7, alpha 2 is the way to go, I guess. All right, with all that covered, um, are there any more topics for the agenda and notes and or for the open floor? Going once, going twice. I've got a jump on. <laughs> Just a general reminder, KubeCon North America CFP is open. Please consider handing in an issue, technical alike, or I mean, specifically for Kubert or something you're working on, on the um, surroundings. <coughs> I mean, CDI and stuff, you know, the, the CRDs, how CRDs are used. I think that's an interesting topic. Also beyond Kubert, I mean, populating PVs with content, David, um, Adam. Um, yeah. And device plugins, Peter, right? Yuval. I think that these are topics if you want to take a look at North America, you might want to submit a paper. It's in Seattle this year. I'm done. Sorry, I was capturing your uh, notes on the community meeting document. All right, um, I, is there anything else to add to the open floor? Okay, well, I think that'll wrap it up then this week. Thanks everybody for attending. Bye guys. Thanks, bye-bye.